Hey, what's going on folks, it's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in the software design series. Today kicks off the start of the component pattern. Now the component pattern is something that's famously used, especially in various games, for instance, but also other applications like database or any real software where you need to organize or build objects in a dynamic way. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce this pattern today. And we wanna go ahead and first just start off by identifying things that are objects and components and start talking about some of the trade-offs of this system. This is gonna be a multi-part series, so make sure that you stay subscribed or otherwise you can check out my course site, which is here at courses.msha.io. Scroll down to the bottom here currently where the software design series is. So anyways, before we get into this lesson, today's video is going to involve some active participation, meaning that at various points there might be opportunities to pause the video. So on YouTube, that usually means spacebar or just clicking with your finger, wherever the pause button is on your application. And well, thinking about some of these design things, because this is a design series, and oftentimes there aren't exact right answers, but we'll have to measure and profile and sort of understand exactly what's going on. Anyways, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into our first exercise with that little caveat here and get started. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is just give you a chance to kind of study this little diagram here, this animation of a game here. We're going to be using gaming examples because I find those one fun. That's what I'm interested in. That's where I have some domain knowledge, uh, but I think it'll apply to many other domains as well. But anyways, what I want you to do here is just take a moment. You can pause the video and just identify what sort of objects or entities do you see in this visual here, this animation that's running through here. And if you took a moment to pause the video here, let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. And I've got a still frame here on the top and the animation at the bottom, just because sometimes it's useful to see things moving around from the original frame. Uh, again, the motion might've drawn your attention to certain details, but overall the different objects that I see that compose this scene are things like, well, Mario, of course, with his red cap on and riding on Yoshi, the dinosaur lizard, whatever he is, <laughs> sort of character. Um, and that's probably one of the main objects that you identified right away. We've got other things here, like these moving um, enemies or friends. Again, you can decide <laughs> who the good guy is in Mario, I suppose. Uh, but they are also uh, another object or entity in this world. There are things like the little red apple you might have seen shaking around. Maybe that's something that you can interact with or collect, or maybe it's just a visual uh, design choice that the creators made. Either way, it is an object or an image in the scene. You've got the user interface, which you might have drawn attention to. Uh, the tiles themselves, so these little blocks that you're walking on, or maybe even the bush uh, that is in a sort of background layer. Uh, and again, perhaps there are more objects or entities that you've identified. And again, it's a nice exercise to actually look at software sometimes and try to just break it down, because that might give you an idea of how you'll structure your actual code if you take a little bit of time to think about the software before you design it. So anyways, there are going to be lots of different things here, even things like wind, um, in the background, you might think if the clouds are moving or whatever. Uh, and then there are, of course, different ways to describe objects, such as if they're dynamic or static or movable or not. Uh, again, those might have been some of the adjectives or uh, things that you picked out just by observing this scene. So already a very interesting exercise to think about in software design. So today's objective for this video and really the rest of uh, this particular series where we're going to be talking about the component pattern is first and foremost just to learn how to organize and maintain what we call a game object. Now this is a gaming world here where I've got Mario here. Um, but again, you might have a different application, some business application where you have sort of one root or important object, you know, the, the object that um, is sort of like the base class or the root object. Sometimes that literally is in programming languages like Java, just called object or in the language object, uh, and then all classes are derived from it. Um, but anyways, in a game, we have a game object. So something that we can create and see, interact with, and so on. And then our secondary goal is going to be to think about maybe some of the performance implications about this particular pattern that we are going to design. Uh, again, these are things that you have to measure or at least think about. And in a game, for instance, they tend to really matter. So I just want to go ahead and leave you with a few of those thoughts. So let's go ahead and start talking about game objects themselves for how we want to structure things. Uh, of course, we've got to let the animation run. That took me entirely too long to do. But anyways, <laughs> as we move forward here, uh, what is a game object? Again, we're doing this software design today in the context of a game, which you see below here. 
Mario is an example of a game object. It's sort of a base class, some primitive type uh, from which you might derive other types from, or as we're gonna find out with the component pattern uh, where you build up a unique game object from components. So anyways, before we get there though, we have to understand game object. So here's an example of code in C++, if that's helpful, right? You could have just some struct here, uh, or perhaps a class if you prefer things to be private by default, where you have the constructor, destructor, and then any other fields that are part of it. So again, that's the, the basic idea here. So uh, generally speaking, at a minimum, we want to be able to identify these different objects in a gaming context, or again, if you're building some other piece of software, so you know, let's say you have a graphical user interface and have a sort of root object, which you know GUI button are you clicking on? In this case, for a game, we want to be able to differentiate between Mario, uh, the bad guys, the background tiles, the clouds in the background, etc. Those are all separate entities uh, or game objects. So typically you need some unique ID per game object. Now I've decided to use a unsigned integer um, with eight bytes or 64 bits. So that gives us plenty of game objects that we can create in our world. But already in this little, little design decision, uh, a question for you, again, an opportunity to pause and try to answer, you know, why might a string might be a problematic ID for a game object? And if you paused and thought about it, you can, you know, think about this multiple different ways here. Uh, and here are a few things that, you know, I thought of. First and foremost, the user might accidentally duplicate the string, right? They might accidentally name the character Mario twice uh, on accident, and that could have replications in how your data is structured. Now, depending on how you're gonna look up or organize these IDs, maybe you have a map or something, and you can avoid this. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter so much. Um, something that I've also observed though with using strings for ID, sometimes folks use const char star, which could be accidentally copied from the stack. It could be reused. So that can also cause problems, um, for how we structure things. Uh, string itself also is a larger memory footprint, right? If someone names their object something very long, maybe it's the full file path to something. So there is some cost or allocation that is costed. Uh, there, if I want to compare strings versus just comparing an ID to see if it's active or available, again, those are different things that might have some cost. So again, we want to be able to have some sort of unique identifier. In fact, folks usually come up with an, even better than just a single integer, some sort of globally unique ID, a good, that's other ID that you could use. Again, maybe you've learned that concept in other domains, but again, we generally want to be able to identify each unique object. So again, if I go back a few slides here, uh, how about just to this one here with Mario, where we identified all the different objects. I want to be able to refer to Mario, these objects, uh, the Apple, etc., with unique IDs, or sometimes these are just called handles. So you might see this in various APIs. Integers are cheap and easy to access, okay? Uh, and they're cheap and easy to compare and so on. So those are uh, some of the reasons that we have here. Um, now, as an aside here, it might be worth noting that every time um, we increment or maybe create a new uh, game object, that we could just have this, again, ID automatically assigned. We probably want to do this with some atomic uh, to make sure that we have multiple threads creating objects, et cetera, that we uh, you know, increment this in a unique way. So again, just something else to think about here. Um, but uh, that was just a little strategy. Uh, and again, oftentimes we probably want to avoid what I'm showing down here in the code. I mean, this is a working example uh, where I'm creating the new objects, but usually you might want some sort of factory or some interface. so a user is not necessarily directly uh, calling new here, okay? That's that's just something to think about. Uh, but you, as the architect of your code, of course, will be working with these lower level uh, primitives and stuff, so this is just a little design thing. Okay, so first and foremost, we've got this idea of a game object to represent some entity, some thing, a 2D image, a you know 3D character in a 3D game, and a way to identify that character uniquely, okay? So that's the idea here. Now, if I want to create different types of game objects, so again, what makes this character here Mario uh, with Yoshi, we'll just consider this sort of one game object since they're you know together here, uh, versus these guys, which might be, again, four unique objects, or maybe, maybe it's five, there's a sort of container or something around these four objects. Um, but let's just consider this again as one uh, different character. But you know they are different. Uh, they might have different properties associated, different behaviors, meaning the actual functions or abilities that they can uh, do. So let's go ahead and think about this a little bit here. So now that we have, again, some sort of struct for a game object, which represents an entity in a game, 
Um, we want to think about how do I differentiate, again, their attributes and behaviors. I mean, even in this example here, Mario, uh, who's a game object, is different from this AI character here, right? This is the character that we're controlling in the game, and this is the one that's, you know, just moving side to side or, or has some behavior, right? Maybe it's attacking or running away or whatever. Uh, but Mario, we're controlling with, you know, maybe the left and the right arrow keys or a game pad or something. Uh, but that's the basic idea here. So again, Either way, there are two different behaviors that we want to capture, and as a result, two different sets of attributes, meaning the actual data behind them, uh, and so on. So another question for you to think about here, uh, just when breaking this down, is what sort of components make up each of these game objects, right? So I've got the Mario here, and then I've got these uh, you know, stackable guys <laughs> that are sort of walking around here. Um, so. My question is, what are the things that make up Mario? And what are the things that make up this AI character? So again, you can go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a moment. Uh, and if you did a moment to, uh, or if you did that exercise by pausing the video, let's see what we found here. I mean, at the least when I did this, there are textures in both these characters and they're animated, right? As the character moves around, you can see the little legs running uh, and so on, or, or at least the back and forth motion, maybe they blink on occasion or something. Uh, there's also collision going on at a minimum, right? So they must have maybe some position data, right? Maybe, um, but there's some sort of like maybe a bounding box is what we'd call this in a gaming example. So we know where the object is. Again, if you want to take this example, this exercise of what we're doing out of a gaming context, just think about a user interface where you click the bunny or, uh, or excuse me, click a box. <laughs> Uh, think about these uh, game characters here, but you click a box. Uh, there must be some way to know the bounds, right? The width and the height of a GUI widget, uh, like a button or something. Uh, so that's what the idea of a bounding box is. Uh, and there might be other specific states, like this character is moving, it's idle, it's active, it's visible, and so on. That's sort of hidden. Uh, Mario probably has unique um, sort of input, meaning, again, we're controlling with a, a game pad or a keyboard or whatever. Um, maybe there's an occasional user interface element, like a dialog box pops up over Mario to show his thoughts or what he's saying. Uh, and the AI itself probably has some you know, behavior to it. In this case, it's to sort of just move left <laughs> in this world, but that's different than what Mario has. So there are different sort of components uh, making up each of these different characters. So what I'm getting at here, again, is I've used this word uh, components, which I'll uh, highlight here on the top left of your screen, uh, is again, the idea that these individual components are what make up the unique character here. So we've got some sort of texture or image that is the Mario here with Yoshi and then a different one for these characters. But they both have them. They're both animated uh, and moving around. Uh, but this set uh, that is that both Mario uh, and the AI have plus their own individual components make these two different game objects. So that's the basic idea here. So let's think about how, again, we create a game object, because now we're ready to actually create Mario and to create that AI character. Uh, so let's figure out what our mechanisms are for instantiating and actually creating these objects. So I could do new game object for Mario, new game object for AI here. And one strategy that we have in programming, and since the series is in C++, is to actually use inheritance, right? And we have inheritance and multiple inheritance, which allows us to build up a new uh, type of object that is still a game object. So let's see how that looks here. And basically what this looks like, if I have my game object and those components that we looked at, texture, collision, bounding box, position, and so on, right? That's what's gonna be common for all game objects. And then we'll have the sort of specific stuff to Mario, uh, which is shown on the left side of this tree and the stuff for the artificial intelligence for this one particular character on the right side, right? Some sort of AI behavior. Uh, so let's go ahead and break this down and look at it in code, right? So we have our components here, right? These could be the individual structures here, right? The texture data, that's the images, the collision box, transform, state, etc. cetera. Um, and then here's our game object, right? With those common set of components, okay? Which is indicated here in our tree. And we have Mario on the left side, which is unique, but inheriting from game objects. So we're sort of adding these additional um, either behaviors if we're adding other functions, or in this case, the actual uh, attributes here, the member variables, which are the new components for Mario. And then for the AI, we've also got some other components as well. And again, let's see what happens though 
I mean, this is th this works and this is fine. Now we've got a way to instantiate Mario. We've got a way to instantiate uh, as many AIs as we want here, and they'll have different components and uh, their behaviors. Okay, um, but how does this work at scale if we want to? add more types of enemies so the game's not as boring or whatever application that you're building so again that's always a question where we're thinking about how to structure uh, a piece of code or a code base how do things scale over time right we might want to reuse this and make mario 2 3 4 etc <laughs> right and this code might live a very long time so you know let's just take a hierarchy here where we start to say okay we're gonna have different game objects and now yeah i want to model those clouds or the the bushes in the background or the apple and those are sort of static objects so i can create those or some trees in the background and then I, maybe i have some dynamic objects we've got mario i've got the enemies maybe multiple types of enemies um but what if i want to do something like this where i have a uh evil tree and this is taken from an example here where i have some static asset but it also has you know some of the um behaviors of enemies right maybe the tree attacks or if you touch the tree uh you know it's game over for your character or whatever um this uh with inheritance actually causes a problem and this is one of the difficulties when you get into deep uh inheritance hierarchies as they're called one you start seeing there's some issues here with you know this evil tree is both sort of static and dynamic so it's already sort of breaking there uh, but then you also have this multiple inheritance, which can be tricky if the tree has different sort of behaviors for static, uh, for what it's supposed to do every frame of the game versus dynamic. Uh, the enemy behaviors are also different every frame of the game, let's say. So this is potentially troublesome here. We, we tend to not want to write code that has this, um, you know, issue where we're inheriting from multiple classes to create or derive a new type. Now there are reasons to do multiple inheritance. Um, if folks uh, comment uh, below and want to ask, you know, I might uh, be able to provide some, but generally speaking, it's a little bit uh, tricky here, right? This is a problem here. Um, I mean, I could show in a quick uh, live code here the difficulty, uh, but basically if I wanted to create like a bot here, that's Mario and AI, right? Maybe we want to have a, a speed running Mario bot or, or do some, you know, cool algorithm to make uh, an AI that plays through the level, but it has access to, uh, Mario here very quickly will find out that if I have two functions member functions anywhere in this hierarchy that are named the same thing I'm either going to get a compiler error or the compiler will just pick uh, what the behavior is going to be I think that's the case more so with older compilers uh, usually you will just get a compilation error uh, which is again a uh, problem itself so you know, this issue of designing our game objects using inheritance and getting uh, or scaling this this idea of having components be just new objects that we derive types from, it's easy to implement, right? We've got inheritance built into the language if you're using an object-oriented language. Uh, but the cons are this is going to be hard to maintain code. Okay, I hope you can see that these inheritance hierarchies get very, very tricky to uh, manage here. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are also some other issues with inheritance and how we have performance. That's sort of, again, our secondary goal for this uh, series or, you know, these videos for today. Um, because there are going to be lots of virtual calls and runtime overhead. So, you know, we might want to try to give ourselves some opportunity to get rid of those uh, virtual calls, right? And especially if we start having these deep nested hierarchies where we're not using all the data, then we're just carrying around these really big objects that don't you know, need everything that they're holding. So that's also problematic. So what's an alternative that we can turn to? Um, and this doesn't fix all the problems, but this is what some games will do. This is maybe what some of the systems that you start off on uh, building is to just say, hey, that inheritance thing, too complex, right? That, that was the issue here. Um, let's do something also that's easy, but removes the complexity. And that's going to be to just use a monolithic game object. Okay. Let's just get rid of inheritance. Let's lean into composition. That tends to be what we want to do. And that's pushing us towards the right direction in this series. Um, but instead what we're going to do is just say, Hey, all the possible components that we have, let's just wrap those under one game object. And yes, you could do this. There are commercial games that do this. You can, you know, look this up here. 
Um, I think I was looking through, uh, might have been the Doom 3 source code or something that had some examples of monolithic objects. I just needed a lot of the components, so it wasn't worth deciphering them into different classes. Um, so you just had everything uh, all together here. So you do pay some cost here, right, of having some pointers to data that might be not instantiated, right? That's going to be eight bytes on a 64-bit system. Um, so maybe that's not a huge cost, but again, I don't know, maybe if you have lots of different game objects like particle systems and these types of things that can add up. So maybe for those, you need a specialized class or something. Um, but again, this, this works, right? This avoids, uh, the complications with inheritance, but as you add more stuff, as this code base ages, as you try to use this, uh, sort of pattern for making Mario two, three, four, five, or whatever <laughs> the case might be, right? This game object class or struct might start getting very, 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 very large, okay? Which can be a uh, problem for performance or at least the space complexity of your application. So again, if you think about that uh, a little bit, maybe there's other pros and cons, but I gave a few. Uh, it's very simple, it works. People do build games like this, but the primary concern is, again, uh, you're, you're sort of having some organizational issues here with all the different uh, components. You also sort of ask, ask yourself, do I want more than one texture? You know, how does that sort of work? I mean, is Mario and Yoshi were those different textures? Uh, should there be five here? Should this always allocate to a chunk of memory somewhere, right? And you're sort of going into heap memory for all of these. Um, so again, we have to be kind of careful here. We also have this other sort of subtle issue that you know, the components, should they be able to talk to each other? Should textures know about collision boxes, right? They're all in the same game object so they can communicate with each other. And I'm going to hit on that in another video here, uh, that that can also be a little bit of a problem here. And again, as I mentioned with the performance, there's all sorts of indirection because these are all pointers. Again, maybe we can live with one level of indirection. So maybe that's not as bad, um, but that's maybe okay. Um, depending on how we're accessing these components, right? We need to check if they're null or not. So, you know, there's little bits of uh, penalties here. And as we access each of these game objects, right? Let's say I have a game object that only uses texture. And then immediately after it, I have a game object that only uses AI behavior. Well, I'm bringing the whole game object with me. So that's not very cash friendly again, as we're passing around these, these really large game objects. Uh, and we will see later on in this series uh, or this set of videos talking about the component pattern that that can be problematic. So anyways, uh, where I want to leave this video off, a little bit of a cliffhanger, so you'll have to check the next video that's coming up, as this one's getting a little bit long here, is to do a little bit of a deeper dive on this idea of the monolithic game object and why it's a problem to just pack in all of our components. Because again, immediately if I go to our pros and cons list, you can see this pattern is very simple. And again, you can make this work, you can you can build a game like this. If you're just building a small game, doing game jam, maybe even releasing, you know, your, your first or some early games, um, this is fine to do. But if you want to scale up, if you want an engine, maybe something that you can reuse, uh, again, I'm going to advise against this. That's why we're here to learn about the component pattern. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to leave you a little bit on a cliffhanger here as we're going to do a deeper dive. Uh, we still got more videos to come, so stay tuned for that. And folks, hopefully you enjoyed this series of video or this style of video and are thinking about breaking down maybe just a screenshot from one of your favorite games, figuring out what are the components, what are the different game entities you see, and you know how would you sort of organize that? In fact, that's a really nice exercise to do before proceeding as you watch the next videos that are coming up for this uh, set of videos here on the component pattern, uh, because then it'll be interesting to see what sort of design decisions or trade-offs you made. The key is to think about, especially for structural uh, patterns, uh, how you want to organize things. Anyways, folks, with that said, thanks for your time and attention, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.